Welcome. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program, and thank you for tuning in. I'm Daniel Davis. Barack Obama has just now become the 47th president of the United States, and one thing he's definitely got on his hands that we're wondering is ever going to get fixed is the economy. Many people have just lost thousands and thousands of dollars as they were approaching retirement years and realizing they have to start all over again. But where does the mess really start from, and how do we stop it? Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is the number one New York Times bestselling author of How to Prosper During the Coming Bad Years in the 21st Century. Originally, as I understand it, it was a book that was done back in the mid-70s and has kind of been revised and updated for today for the most part. He also has on his website The Rough Times. It's a groundbreaking financial advisory newsletter, and it has more than 600,000 subscribers. It's probably the most read, or if not the most read, financial advisory newsletter in the world. And he's here to talk with us about how we can prosper and the pitfalls that we can try to avoid as we approach the 21st century and this mad economic mess that we're in. And I'd like to welcome Howard Ruff to the Beyond 50 radio program today. Thank you for joining us, Howard. I'm glad to be with you. Now, you started uh, pretty much your financial way, if you will, back in the 70s, and there was a lot of tough things going on then, and it almost seems like this day and age, we've kind of mirrored the same uh, way. Why is that? Well, it's like Yogi Berra says, deja vu all over again. (laughs) I think the, uh, uh, when I, when we got, I saw this mess coming uh, three or four years ago, and I decided to uh, write a book. But then I realized I, if I went back to my first book, many of the same factors that caused the the troubles in the uh, bull market and the precious metals back in the 70s, on which uh, my initial fame was based, uh, uh, were repeating themselves. It was happening over again, only more so. So I decided it'd be better rather than write a new book is just to revise the old ones, which I did. I added a couple of chapters and deducted a couple of chapters that are no longer relevant, but pretty much the same. Now, I know as I uh, had began reading into the book is that, you know, at first you might feel, geez, this feels like the end of the world, but then you really get very insightful and very clear with information that you typically don't hear or read in mainstream media, magazines, television, whatever the case is. It seems to have the same old recycled feel when you're out there in mainstream media about economics, but nobody really seems to not only have any true answers, but no real results about how you can fix the situation that we're in. And that's what you certainly clearly uh, provide here in your book. So even though it seems doom and gloom, at the same time you're providing reasons why this happened, and at the same time it's like the answer for how to solve that is right there. Well, look, I'm an optimist. I know you don't think so when you first start reading my book, but uh, great Scott, we have 14 children, five of whom are adopted as teenagers, 72 grandchildren. You can't be a good grandfather and a great grandfather with a, and be a pessimist. You can't do that. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Consequently, my uh, my whole theme is that there is there are silver uh, there are silver linings in these dark clouds, and but the uh, it's going to be very bad time for people that rely on the old stuff on the same old stuff, and that's Wall Street. That's the the uh, brokers who are convinced, hey, the Brooks, Wall Street's going to bottom out and we can make a lot of money in the stock market. Nonsense. Wall Street's not going to bottom out for many years. Mm-hmm. But there are things off the beaten track that are ca- that the average person can do very easily uh, that can actually kind of turn straw into gold. And uh, so you can turn small amounts of money into fortunes. These kinds of times happen maybe once in a lifetime when you – uh, at uh, when you have major turning points, if you if you understand what's happening and the kind of investments that will benefit from it, it's not just investments. There are defensive things you need to do also to protect your family. Mm-hmm. Now we've had many financial experts on this program that, in in some ways, for the most part, seem to be relating the same kind of information that you do, especially when it comes to what's really going on. Why do we see the kind of troubles where the government's all of a sudden giving 600 and some odd dollar billion bailouts to big financial institutions while the Main Street guy is basically having to pull this money out of their pocket? But you really describe in detail, as some of the others have, of why this has happened and how our government misuses funds that people were counting on being there. But then at the same time you say, you know, but why did you count on that? 
Well, I think uh, your, your, your statements are kind of missing the basis of the problem. If, if Congress wants to know what caused this mess, they should go look in the mirror. Mm-hmm. It's a political. It's a political issue. The uh, uh, politics of uh, of uh, mostly Democrats who decided that, hey, we need to make it easier for people who never had mortgages to get them, and so uh, they passed laws which uh, where banks could be punished terribly if they turned down mortgages almost for any reason. They had no down payment mortgages and and uh, starting out with low teaser interest rates and so forth. And so, of course, uh, people who couldn't afford mortgages before all of a sudden swarmed in the mortgage market and created a huge real estate bubble. Well, bubbles always burst, mm-hmm. and that did. But then uh, there are some problems that uh, uh, the Democrats uh, and, and weak-kneed Republicans, this is not just a Democrat problem, and the weak-kneed Republicans all uh, uh, decided that there are votes to be made by helping people get mortgages even if they couldn't afford them. And so that's really the root of the problem. And so the uh, I, I have a lot of, when I do interviews, people say, well, what would you advise the president to do or Congress to do? Well, they wouldn't listen to me anyway, because basically the things they're proposing doing aren't great cover-ups for them. They're not going to admit where the problem is. Well, that's what I was, I guess, in a roundabout way getting to, is that you show one of the roots of the problem now. One of them is, is that, People really don't have a clue if you ask on the street, well, how in debt is America? And you clearly show it's about to the tune of about $50 billion. No, a lot more than that, trillion. Oh, it's a lot more than that, okay. But I know that you also make it clear that it's around $37 billion, or trillion, excuse me. Why did I say billion? Excuse me. It was trillion, yes. Uh, is that that goes toward the Social Security and Medicaid and the huge turnover of the retiring baby boomer generation. And so you really start talking about the Social Security issue. Well, the problem is uh, boils down to like $53 trillion, Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security. Those are unfunded liabilities. Those are liabilities that the government has that they don't put on their balance sheet. And there's a man by the name of David Walker who was the uh, Controller General of the United States, finally resigned, and he's the one who blew the whistle on all this. He spends his time lecturing now telling us that we've got an unsustainable set of problems. So the government, uh, the, you know, the sheer stupidity of thinking that you can uh, borrow your way out of debt, is uh, absolute stupidity. <laughs> yes, it, it is. Absolute stupidity, and someday I'll tell you what I really think. But the uh, this whole idea uh, that the government is going to go spend all this money is simply... Uh, that we're turning to socialism. You know, with socialism, is socialism where government owns or controls the means of production. Well, mm-hmm. they've already done that at Wall Street, and they're doing it quickly now with the banking system. Government can call the shots. They they did it with General Motors. They send General Motors several trillion dollars, or several billion dollars, if if they'll simply do the kinds of cars that uh, Congress and the environmentalists want them to do, the cars that people don't want to buy. Uh, but they're they're calling the shots. And that's exactly what socialism is. And so we're moving headlong into socialism. And uh, uh, and the amounts of money that are being generated uh, have slowed the economy down to a screeching halt. And uh, in the process, we've created a deflationary environment. Uh, And government hates deflation because deflation is what the 1930s was all about. And so they're... They think you can solve the problem by pouring money into it. That's what they're doing. But the problem is that when you have deflation and you are throwing money at it, you're creating monstrous amounts of money, which lay the foundation for a great hyperinflation. Deflation and uh, inflation are monetary phenomena. But the amounts of money that we've created have laid the foundation for probably about a year from now of this turning into a serious hyperinflation, and that's where the real danger is. Now, I know that you had a quote from Will Rogers in there, which I found very unique, in that one of the areas you talk about taking a look at investing into, as he says, is inflation, because it's the only thing that keeps going up. Now, I thought that was interesting, and then you said inflation is the true tax. And when you really think about that, you think, you know, he's right when you consider the purchasing power of the dollar, all this money coming into the market, as you said, they keep 
borrowing it, putting it out there, printing all they can, but it's not really backed by anything. And you realize that your dollar pretty much doesn't buy what it used to, so there's the real uh, increase in income tax, if you will. Well, the irony of it is that uh, on the way there, we'll go through a deflationary period where the best thing you could possibly do is be out of debt and own cash. But that's only going to last about a year. And eventually, starting maybe a year from now, and that's a, my best guess, starting maybe a year from now, uh, all of a sudden the last thing you want to own are dollars or things which are denominated in dollars. So there are you're going to have to, uh, in my opinion, it's best to make the change now and, and move your money and these things into good things and wait patiently. Uh, for example, let's take the stock market, for example. The stock market is not a one thing. The stock market consists of many industry groups, and there are a few industry groups that will prosper and boom during this period. Mm -hmm. Okay, you need to know what they are. But the star of my show here is the precious metals. We made a lot of money on precious metals in the 70s during that last bull market, and we're going to make many times that money this time around when the inflation takes off because the precious metals absolutely boom. They're going to be worth several times more than they are now. Now, I'm just curious why that is. Well, I'm not sure I can explain it. Uh, well, except I can point to history and say history tells us that's what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the first uh, inflation that's recorded was when the Romans conquered Spain and took over the silver mines, and they started making their silver coins based on the silver they got there. But eventually, uh, Rome decided to buy the votes of the people, and so bread and circuses was a big deal. People were sleeping under the under the viaducts, and so they wanted to entertain. They built the Colosseum. They and they had the battles between Romans and Christians. I think the score was uh, lions two hundred, Christians nothing, something like that. Mm -hmm. And the uh, and and so the silver, the, uh, when they depleted the silver in the mines, they decided, well, hey, we're going to mix it with base metals, or we're going to clip the corners, and people caught on and realized you need more, you need more coins uh, for your goods and services, and so the uh, that that was the beginning of inflation. It was a diminishment of the value of the currency, and eventually, currency destroyed Rome, so they were not in a position to fight when the vandals were at the at the gates. And so that's maybe the first one, uh, the first major inflation that history records. But historically, the world's littered with dead paper currencies. Ever since the printing press, we started creating them for in the first place as uh, these. Uh, this paper was receipts for money held in a storage unit, which we eventually called banks. And uh, But the banks finally figured out they could make a lot of money by printing more receipts than there was gold. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so they began printing a lot of these things with banknotes, and uh, and that caused inflation. And so about every seventy years, the main currency collapses. The world littered with dead paper currencies. So you start over again, and we're in a period like that when we are all of a sudden Congress realize they can print unlimited amounts of money. They don't have to be controlled by anything, uh, and so the wealth is transferred to them to spend to buy votes. And and it's taken away from the average person whose money is worth less. I know each time that we bring on a great guests like yourself, we one of the intentions is to make talking about money interesting enough that people want to pursue and become more knowledgeable about it, so that you can make better decisions about what you do with it for the enhancement of your future and the protection of today. And uh, you, you begin to start really talking about some interesting solutions that when these hard times come, I was really surprised that one of the first things you talked about was just storing food. Yeah. And I thought that just made a lot of sense as I was reading. It was like, you know, you're right, because when you think about, say, a situation like a Hurricane Katrina, for instance, <clears throat> we went to an MLK, Martin Luther King breakfast, and they were talking about, are you prepared for an emergency? And I sat there just astounded like, Gee whiz, I never really thought about all those things. Well, you know, when you have a runaway inflation, ordinary commerce is hurt. For example, gas prices are going to go up again. And when gas prices rise, eventually it's hard for the trucks to, uh, to, to, for people to pay f for truckers to come up to the back door and restock the shelves at the stores. And I'm talking about food and I'm talking about anything else 
that you would ordinarily buy at stores. Consequently, one of my first recommendations, this is defensive, uh, when you go to the store, don't just buy one, buy five or ten of whatever it is, or a case, and store it away. And that means you'll be buying it at today's cheap prices, and you'll be consuming it in the future at tomorrow's higher prices, which is, when you get right down to it, a form of investment, a profitable investment. Mm-hmm. And so I suggest the uh, the storage of commodities is a basic defensive strategy. Yeah, and it made a lot of sense, too. And I know that as you uh, continued talking in your book about the things that we need to do here, uh, is that when you were saying investing in precious metals, I remember sharing with my wife that my dad had received a Cougarat uh, back in, I think it was 1977. And as a kid, I was like, so what's this? And he says, well, it's an ounce of pure gold. It's a, a gold coin. And I said, oh, okay. So I took a look. And I was looking at the price of that gold coin, and I thought, well, that's kind of amazing. And then for some reason, I started paying attention to the price of gold. It's like, goodness gracious, Dad, this coin now, you know, a couple of years later, seemed like it was worth about $400, and I was just amazed how that kept going up. Yeah, well, you know, it peaked in value as an ounce of gold at $850 in 1980. <clears throat> now, eventually, Volcker and Reagan got inflation under control because it hadn't gotten so far that you couldn't eventually end it, and they did. So I turned bearish on the metals. I was bullish on the metals during the 70s. Turned bearish on the metals, found other places to make money. As a financial advisor, I'm no no better in my last recommendation. I I have to get people to renew their subscriptions. So I have to be right. And so I've spent, of my 32 years uh, in the business, I've spent 11 years being bullish on the precious metals and the rest of it being bearish on it, looking for other opportunities in stocks and bonds, for example. Now I'm back again. Uh, and they're, uh, I'm not sure they want to let me back into the gold bug church, but because uh, uh, there were some guys that stayed there through the bad days when gold dropped below $200 an ounce again. But uh, nevertheless, the time has come back for these metals to improve. Why? Because the dollar was falling uh, dramatically in value in relation to other currencies. People around the world instinctively were beginning to to convert their money to precious metals, gold and silver. Uh, because uh, all through, through history, there have been intermittent times when you had inflation, the paper currency, and people would turn to gold and silver, and that would bid the price up. Mm-hmm. So uh, if you want to know why that happens, it's because gold and silver represents uh, a, a tangible. It's a very tangible thing. Gold's never been worth nothing. Mm-hmm. And, and they can see that their currency someday might be worth nothing. And so uh, I, I believe that uh, uh, that history is repeating itself, and like Yogi Bear said, it's deja vu all over again. Mm-hmm. And uh, but it goes with in fits and starts. It's not straight up. Uh, and gold and silver right, right now are relatively cheap. And so, can I give you the uh, the principle of how to make money in the markets? Please do, yeah, because I know that uh, it wasn't too long ago I was reading the book Buffettology, and it was a former daughter-in-law of Warren Buffett, and his investment strategy really seemed quite simple as far as how he researches and he buys companies. And it well, I'll give sense. you a simple rule. Okay. Okay, write this down. Buy low, sell high. You got that? Okay. Okay, so... Uh, and now everything is low, but the question is not to buy something just because it's low. Because Buy something because it's low and it's going to go high. Mm-hmm. And precious metals are cheap now, and it's a marvelous time to buy them, and they're going to be worth several times. For example, if you adjust the price of gold from its peak in 1980 of 850 for inflation since then, gold would have to go to about 2200 to even equal that, to... to uh, to get back on an inflation-adjusted basis to its previous high. Uh, gold is, one day it'll be measured in thousands of dollars per ounce. Uh, silver is the poor man's gold, because the average person can afford something who couldn't afford uh, uh, gold because it's relatively more expensive. And so the uh, uh, I, I believe that fortunes will be made with small amounts of money invested in the precious metals. 
Well, that certainly makes enough sense, and then you'll actually have money of real intrinsic value that actually stays ahead of inflation. Is that? Yeah, and then out? people ask me, "Well, great Scott, how would you sell it?" Well, you don't want to sell it; it's your money. Mm-hmm. You don't sell your money. Uh, the uh, but if you ever want to exchange it for paperbacks, I'm sure there's a coin dealer within a within a, a half hour of your house who would buy it from you for paper money if that's what you want to do. But the idea is to get rid of your paper money. That's what we're trying to do right now. Okay. Now, as you've got 600,000 plus subscribers and people are following... No, I don't, and let me correct that. I don't have that now. That's a cumulative total over the years. Oh, a cumulative total. Okay. Well, still, that's quite a few people that uh, have that you obviously have something to say that's, that people want to listen to and take advice from. Well, it all depends. Uh, people, people are kind of... Um, I don't know, unstable in a way. The, uh, For example, they might want to buy gold and silver when it's going up. I have people at church ask me, you're recommending silver. How can you recommend silver? It's so cheap. Well, hey, I, I thought you were supposed to buy things that were cheap when nobody else wanted them. I mean, that's the basic rule of investing. And so, the, uh, so when the metals are down, then people weren't that interested in me. For a while, so I'd have ups and downs with my subscription base, but the uh, the problem is that during those times when things are cheap, buy them, and and then wait patiently till they go up. But there's all everything's cheap right now. You could you could make some bad choices. For example, real estate cheap was well, going to get cheaper, so don't buy it. It's, someday it'll be a fine inflation hedge, but not now. The stock market is very cheap. Uh, but it's it's going nowhere. The stock market is going to be down for years, uh, so you don't want to buy that. Precious metals are cheap; they're down, but they're going to go up because we're creating the environment that drives it up by by all this money that we're throwing at the problems, our economic problems today. Now, as you're talking about precious metals, you also talk about how putting money into mining companies is also an idea that you consider to be helpful in this situation? Yeah, well, there's a, because when uh, when the metals go up, the metals mining companies, gold and silver mining companies, also prosper. Uh, <clears throat> silver, for example, is a byproduct of, uh, of uh, copper and zinc and so forth, mining about... 70% of the total, but there are some pure silver mining companies that I like. And they, these companies range from just exploration companies that don't have anything to producing companies and so with varying degrees of risk. And one of my chores for the rough times every three weeks is to measure which ones of these are, are going to benefit, which category will benefit first, and then which of the companies will benefit. Uh, and, and there's some there's some things to be aware of. For example, a lot of these mining companies are in places in the world that aren't very stable. They, and when they start making money uh, for the investors, they'll be expropriated. There's some in Venezuela, for crying out loud, and Colombia, and places in Africa. But there are a lot of them in Canada and the United States, which are not going to be expropriated. I like these mining companies. I also like uranium mining for a different set of reasons. Uh, we're going to be building uh, uranium plants. There are 35 now, either under construction or on the drawing board, and uh, to solve our energy problems. And uh, there's only uh, half enough uranium above ground to meet their needs. So the uranium mining companies are going to prosper. They're going to do very well. You know, it's just it seems like it's different types of advice from what you would typically hear your Wall Street brokers talking about. You say that in your book. Wall Street really doesn't like gold and silver very much. Why is that? Well, because that's not where they make their money. They make their money on commissions on stocks. Right. So get yeah. you to buy and sell and moving them around and whatnot. Yeah, sure. And uh, so teaching people to make their future based on growth mutual funds or stocks on which the, the uh, brokers make commissions is where their incentive is. Plus, many of them are very young. Uh, a lot of them were just in diapers back when I first burst on the American scene. And so they, they that's all they know. They assume that the old days are going to come back. Well, they are, but it's going to be many years before they do. And so I'm uh, I'm a voice from the dead past as far as they're concerned. For example, with with my book, with the revising of this book, it's been hard to get bookstores to, to buy it because most of the book buyers are young. 
they're liberal. They can't conceive of uh, of my position being correct. Eh? But boy, they'll they'll buy all kinds of books and uh, stock all kinds of books in the front of the bookstore uh, from uh, brokers who are, are telling you how to make money in the stock market in the future. Mm-hmm. I know it's certainly, like I said, from what you see out there, they have a lot of the same common advice that ends up, as you watch it, ends up becoming a television news special about somebody who lost their money following that advice into the stock market. You talk, especially earlier in your book, and it's funny because back in the 80s I was given this advice that you know what you want to do is you want to invest your money but diversify over many different companies, diversify, diversify, diversify. Mutual funds were these big things that were being touted into my face, but you know, it's called you, di- diversifying. <laughs> well, that's the thing is that you there's a there there was a, another uh, <clears throat> author that we had on the program, Robert Kiyosaki of the Rich Dad Poor Dad series, and I found that you guys ring with the same kind of tone that you know mutual funds are a very lousy investment. Four hundred one ks and IRAs just aren't that good. Describe why. Well, not all mutual funds are bad investments. I wouldn't buy growth uh, stock mutual funds. Mm-hmm. They're going to be a bad investment. But there's there's one, for example, uh, Central Fund of Canada, which is listed on the American Stock Exchange. When you buy that, when you uh, buy shares of that, they don't go buy stocks. They go out and buy gold and silver bullion. For every ounce of gold, there's there's 50 ounces of silver. And so that's a good way to diversify yourself. I like this company. I know these people, and I know that they really do buy the metal and store it away in the, in the separate bonded uh, warehouses. But the uh, uh, so some mutual funds are okay, but not many of them are. There's other there are other mutual funds. Uh, there's one other mutual fund that has uh, uh, mining stocks. That's not a bad idea. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I recommend that. I like it. There are other mutual funds that will bet against the stock market, that are bearish on the stock market, and I recommend those. And I've, I've got these all listed in my book. Incidentally, mm-hmm. uh, I have a report on what caused the economic troubles we're in uh, on my website, and you can get it free. It's I think it's the second page of that website, and that's at www.roughtimes.com. You can go there and get absolutely free this six-page special report, and you'll understand a whole lot more about how we got in this mess we're in. But also, there's a list of recommended investments there, and you also get a free book, How to Prosper During the Coming Bad Years in the 21st Century, and that has a list. But the rough times updates that list because things change. Mm. Companies are merged, or companies go in and out of business, and and I, I keep it up to date every three weeks in the rough times. But uh, you want me to t- tell you how do you can go rip me off? How's that? <laughs> well, okay. You go to my website. You sign up for my newsletter at $165 a year. After two weeks, you decide you don't like it. We've sent you a free book and a free CD of Howard Ruff Sings. I used to make a living singing, so just for the heck of it, probably show off. I gave people a CD. But then you ask for your money back, I give it back to you, and you can keep the premiums, keep the book free. How's that? <laughs> I think that's a fair exchange for those who might want to try to beat the system. But <laughs> yeah, you can beat my system. <laughs> well, that's you know what I want to encourage the uh, audience out there. How to prosper during the coming bad years of the 21st century is that we collectively really try to find people such as yourself that, for one, really can show what's going on in a way that people can understand it. And that's the first step uh, because really learning about money and and how all this works, it becomes very interesting when you start to understand what's going on. And then once you see or experience the problems, you begin to know what it is that you can do so that you can actually prosper. And that's what I wanted to commend you on about your book is that you really make the language – to where it's very interesting where people really want to know more about this. Heck, I'm even funny sometimes. There, you know. Mostly. <laughs> but the, uh, my point is this. Uh, the, the abused and neglected middle class needs somebody who talks their language. Mm-hmm. And I, I only write things that I think my children can understand. Not, not that they're childish, they're pretty smart. Mm-hmm. But uh, any smart, uh, reasonably smart high school graduate can, can understand it and What's more, be entertained by it. That's what I try to do. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing this for 32 years, so I've gotten pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
but also remember you got to remember you're dealing with an old guy here. <laughs> you're dealing with a grandfather. Well, what we also like to say is the old growth forest, and there's a tremendous amount of wisdom to be gained by that. <laughs> amen, amen, brother. <laughs> well, again, you know, it's a great book, and we really like to bring, you know, special guests like yourself on because they show you a different side of the coin just as you have where it becomes interesting enough that people want to engage and take responsibility for where they're at and know where they want to go instead of, you know, just kind of turning everything over to a so-called uh, broker or expert. Well, oh, I have I'm a sorry to... advice, the last piece of advice. Okay. Don't wallow in the problems we have today. It's a temptation. That's what you read in the headlines, what you read in the paper, mm-hmm. what you read in the Wall Street Journal. There are opportunities here, huge opportunities, but you have to ignore most of what you read and what you see. And so uh, optimism and pessimism are not objective measurements of anything. It's a state of mind. So get that optimistic state of mind that there are, that there are ways to prosper from what's going on. If if you simply are willing to abandon the old stuff and try, try some things you haven't tried before, and I'll give you some guidance to that, how to do it risk-free. Well, very good. You know, again, it's been a pleasure to have you on the program. Number one, New York Times bestselling author Howard Ruff and his book, How to Prosper During the Coming Bad Years in the 21st Century. I know that we're going to try to have you back on at least a couple of more times throughout the year to basically share with people, you know, hey, get a hold of the book, get yourself, you know, educated so that you can learn to start making good decisions with what to do with where you're at. And go to my like website. Said, I wrote most of the copy, so I know it's pretty good. <laughs> so go to the website, roughtimes.com, and, uh, hey, I'd be happy to have you on board. I'm friendly as a puppy, you know. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Howard Ruff, for being on the Beyond 50 radio program today. That's fine. Thank you. You bet. Again, the book is How to Prosper During the Coming Bad Years in the 21st Century. You know, great reading for those out there who really want a better understanding of why we're in the mess we're in. Uh, And as you begin to understand that, you realize, hey, there's actually a lot of opportunity in here that you can take advantage of as well. We'd also like to thank one of our sponsors for uh, helping support this program today. If you want to create your own future by joining the Immunotech team today, whether you are looking to replace or supplement your current income, start your home-based business on the foundation of 13 years of double-digit growth and expanding sales. From $50 million to $500 million in the next three years with a winning formula of successful tools and support. Especially in a time when companies are feeling the impact of today's economic conditions, Immunitech continues to expand. This integrity-based company offers scientifically proven health and nutrition products, including 30 years of scientific research behind the flagship product, Immunical. Find out how to begin your future today by contacting Peggy Kersey at 503-962-0644 or simply check out the opportunity at www.immunitech.com. Immunotech, that's I M M U N O T E C dot com slash P K E R S E Y. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. Visit our website at Beyond 50 Radio dot com, the number 50 with a five zero, and sign up for our free weekly e newsletter. Be sure to tune in next time and remember, live your day past halfway.